Good morning, autonomizers. I hope that uh, clipped came in nice and clear. This is uh, our first time doing this, and uh, we're going to see how smoothly this train wreck goes. <laughs> During that intro, I, I almost want to say, oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, my name is Joshua. I'm here with Tony, with Daniel, and Tyler. Uh, we're the first brave ones to uh, go live on uh, Do It Live Autonomy Podcast. So uh, today we're just going to be going over some of the highlights from this last week. Uh, we have some great clips from uh, everything that took place, and uh, then we're just going to have a roundtable discussion on it. Uh, in the future, we hope to bring back some special guests uh, and somebody that's brave enough to, uh, to join us. And uh, really looking forward to what comes out of uh, this podcast as we uh, try and capture all the badass stuff that's happening uh, as the weeks fly by inside of season two. So uh, go ahead and uh, maybe give yourself a, a brief introduction as we go around this roundtable. Uh, how long you've been with the autonomy community? And uh, we'll start with Tony. Cool. That's what I was going to do. I was going to hop in. Uh, I'm Tony Rurink. Um, I joined uh, Autonomy Season 1. Uh, I think it was back December, uh, what, 2018 now? <laughs> yeah, it, that's when I first got the email. But uh, And then I was a Tragedy and Hope member since uh, roughly 2012, 2013. So uh, I've been around uh, I'm an avid School Sucks listener. I'm super into productivity uh, and discovering my true potential and uh, trying to be uh, trying to find the good life. So uh, that's why I'm here. And uh, I, we're doing a decentralized education. That's what this is. And I'm having such a blast doing it. Uh, and it's been a very empowering experience, and I'm so happy to be here today with you guys. Awesome. Daniel? Well, that's that's my name. Uh, Dan, Danny, Daniel, whatever you prefer. I don't really care. Um, I also got the autonomy email back in November or December of last year, and uh, I immediately hopped on it. thought it would be useful to me. Uh, before that, I had already been a T&H uh, advanced access member for mm, not definitely not as long as you were Tony but uh, for maybe two or three years before that um, I had always been interested in Rich's work ever since I found it as with Brett Corbett all these guys um, I have a website of my own called ageofutopia.info uh, if now is the time for a plug um, <laughs> I, I like to focus on historical and philosophical research. That's what I spend most of my time on when I'm not at a boring old job. So, uh, yeah, I think for now, as an introduction, that'll do. Cool, cool. What about you, Tyler? Uh, my name's Tyler Bloyer, and I'm a season two autonomizer. As weird as that feels saying. Uh, I always think that sounds weird. <laughs> <laughs> Representing the season two class, felt like somebody had to come in and make sure all the season one people were uh, keeping keeping the par up, level up for us season two people, you know, keeping it exciting. And uh, honestly, I, I think that what's going on here is really great. I think uh, the course uh, so far has been wonderful. And uh, one of the things that I'm coming to realize more and more and I, I've said to other people out loud and I think it sounds kind of weird still saying it out loud is you know that you can really only learn anything yourself ultimately and there can be teachers along the way and so like six years ago I was actually met Richard out in Connecticut and we were having a beer together after a Mark Passio event 
And I told him how much he helped me and I was giving him all this praise and he turned it around and he's like, no, he's like, you did all that. I, you know, put the work out. I, I did things, I did podcasts and whatnot, but you picked it up and you integrated it and you learned this stuff by yourself. And I kind of, you know, I was like, oh, you know, young grasshopper uh, <laughs> you know, to the wise master. And, uh, you know, ever since then, I kind of always catch myself before you know, phrasing it a certain way that, you know, really that's what autonomy is all about is, is learning, you know, and, uh, being an autodidact and, but then being able to use mentors too, and, uh, teachers and community of, of people that are here and which have been really awesome so far. So I'm excited to see how this all goes and excited to watch how, uh, this flagship episode goes. Awesome. Thank you so much, Tyler. Cause that was, a great introduction. Uh, Joshua, <laughs> who are you? Yeah, my name is Joshua Hale, and uh, I'm the executive director for Autonomy. Uh, I really am fulfilling my life's purpose with uh, being a part of this. And uh, I've said it earlier this week, but I've, literally everything in my life has taken place in order for me to be here right now. And uh, I couldn't be more happy with uh, the community that I've found and the project that I'm working on because ultimately I'm working on myself and this is just a reflection of that. So uh, it's mirrored pretty clearly. Um, I've been a part of this since the, uh, not the conception because Rich has been working on this for over a decade. But uh, as soon as I heard Rich's intention with uh, wanting to uh, put together a course, uh, I, I immediately started blowing him up because I had some experience creating courses with other clients. Uh, I've been doing digital marketing for about eight years now and so have a, a wide array of skills that are constantly being sharpened and uh, one of the biggest things I got out of season one last year or last season was uh, sales and just understanding what that means, how you can be a salesman with an integrity and uh, align with your values. And that's when things really uh, getting good because you, what I heard Rich say this last week was a sale, sale a short term relationship salesman is typically what that uh, dirty car salesman that everybody thinks of is that you're just going to deal with them once and they're going to rip you off. Uh, but a, a long-term salesman is, are the good ones out there that uh, continuously build value, build relationships and um, being able to uh, listen and understand what it is that people need and so that they can fulfill, fulfill that. So that's, Immediately, uh, I got a lot out of that, and uh, I'm, I'm applying it, and uh, opportunities just continue to, to blow up. So, really excited to be here. And this podcast is uh, the next step. Never quite knew I was going to be doing a, a podcast, but I'm really happy to be sharing the responsibility. Uh, and uh, we can stumble through this first one with a little bit of grace, and I'm really looking forward to where this goes sweet so uh, let's now uh do we want to talk about last night's lecture i'll let you guys lead since i only caught an hour of it and uh yeah we can wrap about that quick yeah if you weren't distracted by all the memes uh there was a really great lecture going on <clears throat> um some of the highlights that stood out to me was rich's definition of the good life and uh i can share uh, a little peek at what that was. Yeah, health, happiness, competence, reliability, consistency, patience, persistence, appreciation, family, friends, love, wealth, freedom. I those hit it on the head pretty well. Yeah, it's it's such a big question that you're never really asked while you're in school. Like, wh what is the good life, and how do you want to achieve that? You're just basically told to taught to memorize what's on the board. So I never really asked that question or had a grasp of that. And I know it has deep philosophical roots. Daniel, do you know the, the 
kind of origin of that of that thought idea? Uh, as far as I know, I could be wrong about this, but I think that was a Socratic idea in the first place, living the good life, uh, specifically through the act of questioning your motivations and you know why you are engaged in certain relationships with other people. Socrates is great. Uh, dictum was the unexamined life is not worth living. I think that the good life has to do with that idea. Um, I think also the Stoics were proponents of the notion of a good life um, through finding serenity. Uh, that was their big term. But uh, that's about all I know on that specifically. I'm not sure if uh, maybe there's an earlier source or a later source. I could be wrong about Socrates, but nonetheless, well, his name that is... Rings, that rings true. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I've recently been going through uh, Peikoff's uh, History of Philosophy, and to have that kind of linear walkthrough has really helped me grasp the, the concepts instead of them being just floating as abstracts. And uh, I definitely remember him covering that. <clears throat> What's great about this, uh, this slide is just having everything spelt out for you. You can kind of fill in your own blanks with this map presented. Yeah, the good life, the center column, that would fit very well in someone's GTD system in the area of uh, areas of responsibility. Mm. Because those right there are areas where you are um, continuously trying to, you know, uh, keep them at a certain state. So, and there's different steps you have to take to make sure you uh, maintain, you know, a certain level of quality in those areas. So I, I think that that list is uh, very beneficial to anyone who is looking to define where their areas of responsibility should be. Yeah, and all of those things, all the 13 of them are perfectly within every person's sphere of influence. Like none of them are these grandiose things that are outside of oneself. They're all things that can be applied to uh, the individual by the individual, him or herself, which is crucial. I mean, you know, number 13 isn't go out and save the world then you'll live a good life. It's, it's freedom. <laughs> that, hey, that was, that was one of my problems coming into this is, uh, you know, having that savior complex, you know, right. thinking, thinking that, you know, I'm going to be the one that's going to go out and uh, be the lead leader of this movement that changes the world or something. But it, it's a lot more than that because you have to focus on yourself and then organically grow your network. And, what happens is if you keep adding value to other people's lives, um, you know, they become interested in, in uh, doing this process, going through this process themselves. So I think it's very important to focus uh, inwards first before you uh, move to the external. Right, right. Like the idea of leading by example is so powerful because, I mean, you know, you could personally be the one to close the doors on the Fed, but unless people have actually changed their minds about things like wealth and freedom and currency in general, there's just going to be another fed that pops up. So, you know, the, the, the change has to occur internally and you can only do that for yourself, but I'm just reiterating what Rich has already stated. So. Yeah. And one more slide that I'm going to highlight from the lecture last night out of the 170 of them was uh, how, how do you get to that point? And this is the, top 10 challenges that new students face uh, when they join autonomy. And really these are all picked up from our programming as from our families, from our society, from schooling. Um, and I definitely had to work through quite a number of these just to get to the place that I'm at. Did any of them jump out to you guys? Absolutely. <laughs> uh, learned helplessness. Uh, that's something I dealt with and, and uh, still deal with a little bit, but it's gotten a lot better. And then of course, um, time management, uh, energy management. I think they both uh, are the same thing really in the end because your time is your energy. And if you have uh, areas in your life, processes that are sucking energy out, you wanna be able to recognize that and then uh, you know change depending on that feedback. So, um, yeah, and then I, I think another one is uh, that 
I don't think is really mentioned on here. Well, I guess lack of self-confidence fits into it, but the uh, provisional self-esteem. Um, e even nowadays, like I'm still struggling with that. I notice that I have, you know, a proclivity for uh, seeking out approval. So yeah, um, this, this list I, is very apropos because it fits a lot of how I felt going into the course. Uh, and the, you know, the courses helped me a lot uh, try to work through those issues. Um, and also seeking out, um, it, autonomy is kind of like a river. So you start at like this pool, you work your way up and you see all the tributaries that feed into it. And so you can, you can start to explore those different tributaries uh, that will focus on each one of these uh, problems. Um, so I, that, that got a little abstract, but I'll give you some more concrete examples of that. Like uh, this course has led me to multiple other courses that uh, lays focus in on certain uh, aspects of this list. So, you know, I got into the university and that focus, and then that got me into second brain, and second brain focuses on the time management and loss of energy. Uh, autonomy helped me a lot with um, my social skills quite a bit, and also uh, just working through my learned helplessness. So, um, yeah, you, you just got to take in what you can here, but don't be afraid to look at all these resources that the community is providing because those resources can uh, help you focus in on this, uh, problems that are specific to you because everyone has their own specific set of problems. It's important to recognize what those are through reflection. That way you can uh, have a little bit more direction in your uh, journey through autonomy on what you uh, to yourself should focus on. Awesome recap. Yeah. S scarcity mentality. I was covered nicely last night and that was something I've really, it still has some stickiness uh, on my reality, but I've really come a long ways from being raised on government cheese and no money management being taught to me. Uh, <clears throat> it, it's, it's something that I've, yeah, had to deal with, wasn't even aware of it until uh last probably like six seven years and uh and now it's just uh takes willpower to uh constantly be scanning my thought processes and looking for where it's popping up and uh one of rich's best tips on that was instead of thinking like oh i can't afford that oh i can't i'm not going to be able to do that you just ask a question, how can I afford that? And that literally turns things around and opens up your prefrontal cortex and to start thinking of solutions instead of that declarative statement of fear that you can't do it. And uh, that's really helped me out a lot by just allowing things to start uh, coming my way because I was in charge of stemming the flow in the first place. It sounds to me like you're talking a lot about um, reverse engineering because that was another thing I caught last night when I did when I was in the lecture, and that's something I constantly come back to, even with um, the second brain course. Uh, a major aspect of the course was envisioning outcomes, like what is what is done look like, and how do you get to done. Be and then breaking that down in small bite-sized pieces that you systematically work at day by day instead of trying to cram it all in, you know, you, it's a slow burn. So yeah, that's been an incredibly valuable point that I found elsewhere too. So it, wow. there's a lot of uh, solid foundation there to work from. Great, great. Tyler, this is your first season. Any of these uh, look familiar? Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, I think daily I cycle through, through these 10 things and, uh, you know, it's a process to work out of these, uh, if you're dealing with these or, or working through them really. I mean, fear is something that 
you're going to work through. You don't necessarily get rid of it, right? It, it's you deal with it. And, uh, you know, for me, that's something I have to do. And uh, all of it is really a process. And so I think uh, anyone that would think that we're, you know, if, if this is the first time coming across any of the stuff that we're talking about and thinks that we're just kind of explaining this to them and, and they, you know, and that they're going to get it right away or that we're trying to think that they're going to get it right away or something like that, you know, would, I, I don't think any of us think that way or anyone along the path is thinking that, you know, that things happen right away, you realize it's all a process. And that's kind of reiterated throughout the course, I think, so far, from what I've noticed. And, uh, but, but then what happens when you start to try to deal with some of these things, or start to try to live the good life, uh, a lot of the time is, uh, you, you'll become overwhelmed with um, initially or throughout that process. And so another question that I like to ask Joshua is, uh, what would it look like if it were easy? And I, I got that from Tim Ferriss, when you're dealing with overwhelm, and, and for me, my personality type, I'll, you know, have a list with 30 bullet points underneath that and subsections of that. And then those are over in Excel sheets. And then there's a brain model spun up for it. And sometimes you just need to step back and start to say, well, what would this task look like if it were easy? And it didn't take me all weekend. What if I could do it in an hour? What if I just cross that off the list and do the minimum requirement, you know? And a lot of the time that kind of moves the ball for me and, you know, helps work through some of these processes of paralysis by analysis to be able to, you know, just say, you know, what can I do to get this done now rather than, you know, in a month or a week or next weekend? How can I just cross this item off the list now? And a lot of the time that'll help you kind of work through whatever those things are that you're struggling with. Definitely. That's a really great suggestion. Well, let's go ahead and uh, move along and uh, jump back to the beginning of the week. Uh, we had last week's Q&A, and uh, I don't believe any of us grabbed any clips from that, but uh, we will from this point moving forward. And then on Tuesday night, we had uh, Brett Vanat come on and discuss how his un university uh, performed and was experienced. Uh, I got to join for some random aspects of it, ju juggling my family and, uh, and personal time. Uh, but I got a lot of value and I'm looking forward to the replay. Tony, do you have anything to add to that, Daniel? Yes, me and Daniel were both there. And it was um, a three-day event where uh, each day there was four lectures, except for the last day there was three. Um, the focus was on pretty much dealing with going from information overload to having a product or being able to create something, uh, create, you know, out of uh, your information. So uh, I would say for anyone who struggles with uh, finding, like creating an insight or something from all the information they've collected, I would say that the university is, a, is an awesome first step. Uh, my favorite so far <laughs> is Moritz because uh, he mentioned the second brain, which I've since purchased and started to go through that. Um, yeah, a lot of great insights uh, for anyone dealing with those issues. What do you think, Daniel? The whole thing was great. And um, I, I liked how, I, I'm sure this was on purpose, but the three days divided up as they were by topic kind of mapped nicely onto the idea of the trivium. So the first day was about information and what to do with it in general, where to put it, how to organize it. Second day was about what to do with it, uh, you know, like how to, how to formulate some sort of cohesive body of knowledge. And uh, the final day was presentation. So grammar, logic, and rhetoric right there. Um, so I like that, that, that brought a sense of structure to the entire weekend. It wasn't just a smattering of, of lectures all willy-nilly. Um, it, it made a lot of sense. Um, personally, I don't know if I could say I had a favorite presentation, at least not until I'd gone back and seen the replays, but, uh, I was probably most looking forward to the presentations by Kevin Cole and, uh, Professor CJ from the Dangerous History Podcast, because, I mean, for a long time, I've wanted somebody, anybody, to give a, a cogent presentation on a historical method, like how they personally 
parse through the details of history and make sense of it. What's the historiographical method? Um, and I think that they, uh, they delivered on that. I, I can't wait to review the entire thing. Everyone did a good job. I don't think there was a bad presentation. Um, so uh, I think that this is a pretty good sign that if, if Brett managed to pull this off for his very first summit, the next one will probably be even better. So keep it up. Can you describe uh, just briefly uh, what that historical research looks like? What do you mean, the historical research that I'm doing or that they were doing? The methods that they uh, uh, proposed. I like going to the library. Yeah, yeah, that was cool. <laughs> Yeah, well, I think, I think one of the main takeaways that uh, was an overarching theme was primary documents. Go to the primary documents. <laughs> and yeah, that, that seemed to be the gist of it. Uh, I would say that's key point to extract. That was pretty powerful because uh, that's something that I've never done. It takes a lot of effort. I've, I've always been a trained high, uh, headlines reader and then jumping into the article or source uh, that's talking about the source is typically as far as I've ever gone. And to, to know about primary sources and to like don't even let those interpretations like get into your consciousness without first like identifying it as a core from the beginning i thought was just yeah like i said really powerful it's like oh. it's a longer version of the idea of signal versus noise because you know you you're reading it third fourth hand some some historical statement when you got to trace it back and you find that maybe the person who originally wrote it or said it was doing so in a completely different context but it's just, you know, the ideas are lost in translation. That's the fun part of historical research, in my opinion. That's when the game is on and, you know, find, pulling that thread and finding where it comes from. And every now and then it'll actually lead somewhere substantial, but a lot of times there'll be exaggerations and misrepresentations. So uh, that's why I really appreciate uh, guys like Kevin Cole and CJ explaining their methods because for so long the quote-unquote alt media or whatever i mean since the 60s really um with guys like well i don't know when myron fagan was around but there have always been these like so-called conspiracy researchers who are they they claim historical arguments but they never really reveal the method for how they arrive at their conclusions and i think that got a lot of people into trouble when they would just blindly repeat what these researchers had to say and then weren't able to actually back it up it kind of spoils the entire movement. So I think we're actually moving things forward by elucidating a cogent method. Yeah, ex the title expert isn't enough anymore. Tyler, you you joined the, the, the summit too. Do you have any highlights you want to mention? Um, I, I was on Friday and so I didn't, wasn't able to attend the whole weekend, but it was um, very, uh, good stuff. Very interesting information. I, I myself, uh, like I said, I've, I've had had my own problems with dealing with overwhelm and information overload. And I think it's an interesting thing to kind of think about, about uh, the fact that, you know, kind of the, the trivium itself, it's, it's a limited model in, in a sense, because, you know, you can't have all the grammar and, and uh, you know, if you start a brain model, I've started a brain model myself, uh, years back and you quickly come to realize like how limited what you understand about all uh, of what you're looking into really is you know and how you know you, you you can have only so much grammar and so it has to be you know a diligent uh, set of rules or processes that you use for discerning the truth about something or discerning the history of something but a history itself you know is just really what other people have documented and so primary documentation is absolutely preferred but even then it can be altered and skewed and misinterpreted and mistranslated you know and uh so it's even even then i think we we all have to be very careful of checking our version of history right even if we have an alternative view of history and that's not to say that you know, we shouldn't do research. I'm not trying to dissuade anyone from doing research about any particular topic, but it is paradoxical that we can only know so much and we are limited 
uh, even though we have an infinite potential to do things and to explore, uh, you know, our freedom when we have it, uh, there's only so many things that can collapse in, in this one lifetime, in this physical presence, at least to my understanding of, of how things work. So, you know, it's more about, in my opinion, uh, right livelihood, coming to an, uh, how to live in a, how to create a culture of excellence in yourself, right? And then live that way 100% of the time if possible, that knowing that we're not perfect either. And that, uh, so a way of being rather than what you know necessarily. And I know that's getting way off from university. <laughs> but I like to inject a, kind of a, something that maybe wasn't considered or thought about, you know, through the presentation. Well, I have something to add to that, isn't, um, because you're right, like we, we can't know everything. So it's important, I think, to look at other people uh, that you're getting information from and trying to discern like, what is their integrity um, uh, in regards to information? Uh, are they doing their due diligence? Because that way you can establish some trust in that person and then it kind of creates like a natural heuristic, you know, that uh, short form of thinking where you can kind of use uh, their thinking too uh, to fill in the, the areas that you haven't gone into. <laughs> Look, it's a, it sure. is, Without yeah. offloading it, I mean, you can never really offload fully to somebody else because they're going to make mistakes too. And, um, you know, I've seen a lot of cults form around <laughs> people that are in the truth, quote unquote, community with what kind of what you're talking about. If people, yeah, you don't have time to look into things. You want to be able to trust what other people are saying. Um, sometimes that can turn into blind faith and then yeah. you have a religion. <laughs> that, well, that's why you, that's why you have to constantly do like a feedback check. You know, you do, um, uh, a check in on, on, on integrity. Like, uh, you don't accept everything. You have to switch from, uh, short thinking to long form thinking, uh, here and there to check in and make sure, okay, if I'm going to be, um, accepting some of what they say, their, their conclusions, then I should, still be checking, uh, fact checking them once in a while to make sure, you know, <laughs> I'm on the right track. Yep. Sprinkle in some of those primary sources in order for you to create your own opinions and to reflect on. Yeah. And be very careful of the idea of certainty. The idea that, you know, I've done all the work that's required, so I've got my conclusion and that's that. I think that's a really dangerous place to be in, you know, you can always be, you're not, as, as you were saying, Tyler, I mean, nobody's knowledge on any subject is ever really complete. So I, I wouldn't uh, assume that one's conclusion on a topic would be complete when their, their knowledge or information based on it, I mean, pretty much with a certainty, ironically, is not complete. So yeah, it's, it's tricky. It's tricky. And a lot of people like to make very definitive historical arguments and, you know, this is the truth and that's that. I don't know. I don't want to say that you can't know the truth, but uh, when it comes to really dynamic, complicated issues that occurred, you know, before we were born, I think it's pretty safe to say you're not going to know the actual truth. Uh, so we can, I like to use history or historical research, not so much as like a, a place to plant my flag and say, here we are. Um, but more as like a guidepost, like this seems to me to be what was. And uh, assuming that my understanding is adequate, I'll use that to guide my future behavior. But uh, yeah, to, to create a religion out of it or a dogma out of it, I think is a big mistake. And unfortunately, a lot of people like to do that, not just in the so-called alternative communities, but I mean, in, in the mainstream, you know? That's how history is presented to us in school. This is what happened. Here's the narrative. That's all there is to know. And so from here, we'll move forward. You know, that's, that's how we are conditioned to accept the, the civic mentality that uh, school gives to us. The three branches of government were established. And now the, you know, we play within the system. We vote. That's our recourse. Um, yada, yada, yada. <laughs> We need to be careful with history, for sure. 
That was really displayed well in last night's um, guest video by Jesse Itzer, the French scientist, talking about how he was wrong about saying his conclusion was impossible, and it delayed his own research by like five years just because he gave that concrete answer without really knowing what was possible. And I mean, how, how could you even, yeah, avoiding definitive <laughs> answers like that, yeah, it could just, it, it, it just causes more uh, problems for you. Absolutely. Yeah, the consensus science, right? Of the, the climate scientists that have the consensus on, when, when that's a fallacy in itself, so having a consensus in science would be a fallacious argument because it's the appeal to, you know, the popular opinion really, and that doesn't appeal to the truth. Exactly. exactly. That's, such a, that's such a bad argument too because it, it shoots itself in the foot. It's like, okay, let's just pretend for a minute that consensus is a, a valid argument. Okay, then all I need to do to prove you wrong is find one scientist who disagrees. Oh, don't have a consensus anymore, so <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> case closed yep. well, let's move move along uh i know we had lisa put on a, a cash flow uh meeting night i wasn't able to make it i don't believe any of us here was able to catch it is that correct That's so true. uh cash flow is a game from robert kawasaki uh, and it helps you figure out assets from liabilities uh i, I did hear her say that uh, Monopoly is blows, I think was what she said, and she really loves cash flow. So uh, hopefully she's going to be doing this weekly, and uh, we can bring her on as a guest uh, in future episodes to talk about this more. So next up, we had uh, David Rodriguez talk about homeschooling, and um, I got a clip ready to go that we can uh, take a little peek at his presentation that's going to be released uh, here shortly within the community. I saw the, the ultimate less ultimate history lesson um, by Rich and Tragedy and Hope um, some years ago. I reached out and um, I was because I got so angry about the system. And uh, what, while I'm in uh, San Jose, California, there's schools that are named Horace Mann School, and I'm driving past these schools and it says Horace Mann. I'm like, why is this school named after Horace Mann? Dude, he's a bad guy. You know, he bought the system over. I said, I want to see a school named after Ghetto. So I reached out to um, John and said, hey, can I use your name for, you know, for, for posterity purposes? I want to, like, get your name out there. And um, so I flew out there and met him. And then um, uh, his wife asked me to publish the book. I said, I, okay, let me think about it. <laughs> and then I got back to him in a couple of weeks. I said, I'll do it. Um, and he was working on a new book. But then he said, uh, Let's let's republish the old one that I've done. You know that put a lot of time into that, so let's do that one. And then so that started the relationship, and then little by little figuring out how to do this. And then um, I got to stay over at his place a couple times and uh, hang out with him and Janet, as uh, maybe Rich and uh, Lisa have as well. But um, it was a really special relationship, you know, to uh, converse with him and about covers and getting blurbs and just you know different essays and stuff to get in there and doing editing um, and. It's so funny. I don't. I don't think I've ever told you this, Rich. But like, we were emailing back and forth, and like, we became like friends. And he was like, maybe he does it with you. He was like calling me Dave Ski, you know. I was calling him John Ski, you know. It was like we're buddies, you know. And same yep. as well. Like, man, see so what you did for him, you know, through the ultimate history lesson. Just amazing, um, you know. I just am so grateful for you guys. So it was just kind of that's how it worked. And so now we're on the next next phase, and. Um, I didn't mention this also in the, the little talk here, but um, he said in 1995, one of his talks, the talk from, um, was it the, I can't remember the name of it right now, but he said, it's no longer debatable. No, these kids are suffering and it's time to draw a line in the sand. And so in combination with some of the things that he said, it's like the system is not reformable, you know, and how many more centuries are we let this thing go on? And then if you've looked into like Agenda 21 and the, the, the agenda that they have for global, global climate change type stuff, um, you know, the, the powers behind this system have really nefarious intentions um, in my research that I've been able to conclude. Um, so getting the kids out of the system is one of the most um, revolutionary acts and like 
saving graces, you know, for the mind and the um, emotional life of the child to get them out of what they're trying to do. They're really trying to make the herd and uh, get rid of the individual, make some collective group and uh, really just delete the personal identity and uniqueness, which is so um, elemental and fundamental to the human experience. And it's, um, it's just great, you know, that uh, Gatto lived. And so um, this is something called the Gatto Project we'll talk about later, but just to get his name out there and help kids get out of the school system. Man, such a powerful message. If this is the first time hearing anything like that, then, uh, yeah, check out John Taylor Gatto. I think over the years now, I feel like I, have, I personally knew him. Uh, he's just become such a kind of – uh, array of wisdom into my life and I was just checking out uh, the underground uh, history of education audiobook and I it was infuriating like it, it, it's it's one thing to kind of just like okay school's bad I need to like unschool for myself but then think about then think about uh, what I'm going to do for my daughter but to hear the actual evidence is just so upsetting. Uh, indeed it is. I, I'm curious. Uh, I bought this new edition. I have, I have the old edition as well. Um, but this was split into volumes, and I haven't been able to find the other parts of the book yet. It must be still being published. Uh, I bet Dave could answer just yeah, that I wish question. I could have asked him that because uh, that looks a like whole lot less intimidating, and that's why I hadn't read the book yet. Was just because of how thick it was. Oh, it's it's so wonderful though. Like, honest, I'd be interested to hear, like, do a poll and see how many people in autonomy have been influenced by John, because uh, I would say my own experience, John has been one of the biggest drivers in my self-directed learning um i can attribute a lot of a lot of my own uh personal growth to him so uh, what do you guys uh have to say about uh john and his work um and how does this re how does this relate back to historical research um because we were just talking about how um we may we may not be able to make a concrete statement uh in regards to historical research but how much can we trust John's work? Uh, do you guys think? Uh, you're well, muted, me, like, Daniel. He, he lived the experience. Uh, he actually, you know, experienced that uh, as a self-evident truth, what he experienced, what I would call that as a life experience, you know? So in that way, you can take what he, what he's saying about the system and how it operates and, you know, how he felt like the lid on the jar of fleas. I mean, those types of things, you can't really take away from somebody, right? Like their experience and how, how they're explaining it to you. You could, you could, I guess you could question them on their authentic authenticity and their motives and things like that. But over the years, I think, especially up towards the end and John recording the ultimate history lesson, you can see that he was authentic, right? I mean, he didn't have to do any of that. He didn't need to do it. Uh, he was, he could have just sat back and fished in, in upstate New York for the rest of his life and not done anything else. Uh, to help anybody understand what he understood. Um, but then at, at times, you know, there's quotes, statements in his books, things that I'm like, oh, man, you know, you kind of, it's cringeworthy stuff. But everybody's going to do that. And it's just how much of that do you tolerate before you kind of think that they're shilling or something. And I, I would never say that John was doing anything like that. So absolutely, his work is invaluable. Um, I think Dave uh, brings... Uh, David brings an extra uh, set of skills to the um, explaining of John's work and his energy was really great that night and anytime I've ever listened to David talk. So that was really exciting to watch. Um, I, I think one of the things about autonomy so far is these special guests and kind of like things that I didn't really expect coming into the course that happen um, that are really, you know, like total bonus material that, ha uh, you know, on Tuesday, Wednesday nights, there's always something cool going on that you can listen to. And uh, that's something that people that are interested in autonomy can, you know, kind of look forward to if they're going to enter the course is that it's not just Friday nights and Sunday mornings. There's usually things going on throughout the week 
And uh, there's a big homeschooling community, as, and a lot of the stuff is geared towards the information that John Taylor Gatto put out. So absolutely, he's affected all of our lives um, in one way or another. If we've uh, been paying attention to his work and enjoyed his work, so yeah, he's a uh, he's a big mentor to me for sure. Yeah, I remember uh, when I was taking out the garbage working at McDonald's years ago, listening to John Taylor Gatto clips that uh, yes. <laughs> maybe didn't go for the most, uh, let's say, fulfilling feeling during my shift, but it, uh, it certainly planted seeds in my mind. Um, I love Gatto's work. I've probably listened to the Ultimate History lesson like three times over the years, maybe more. Uh, but every couple of months, I like to just go back and see if there's any new unseen footage of Gatto on YouTube. And then I just wind up watching the same stuff I've already seen over and over again, because it's just great. It's like uh, the sort of thing you could watch the same hour lecture 30 times over the course of, you know, I don't know how many years. And every time you're going to get something new out of it. Uh, that's the hallmark of a dynamic, thoughtful speaker who's, uh, well, as you said, Tyler, he's, he's not just some cold historian who's taking a serious academic look at the school system. He was actually inside of it. And that that breathes life into the problem. So as far as his historical authenticity goes, um, I don't want to say that's secondary to his experience, but his experience is, is it's a major part of what makes his work valuable because so much of all of his books, really, at least the ones I've seen, have been interspersed with personal stories of you know students that he knew uh one that always stood out to me from the ultimate history lesson was the story of uh, some kid who was drawing comic books in the back of his classroom he was copying out of some other comic book and gato kind of stopped him in the middle of class and said what are you doing the kid said i'm drawn from this comic book and instead of like taking his pen away or whatever Gatto's like, oh, he, he corrected what the kid was doing. Like, oh, notice how they do perspective in the actual comic book, and how come you're not doing that? So he wound up sending the kid to the library to get a bunch of art books. And I think he said the kid actually wound up going on to work for Marvel Comics. Um, so th that always stood out to me, and there are a number of stories. But uh, what's nice about Gatto's work now, as opposed to when the, uh, the underground history of American education came out in the, I think, early 90s, now we've got archive.org and Google Books. So, you know, when, when he makes some seemingly outlandish quote uh, from some document written in 1902, now we actually have the ability to go back and look it up. You can find usually a, an ebook or PDF of the actual book he's quoting from. You can go right to the page number and you can read it for yourself and see if he's exaggerating. And uh, this is something that Brett talked about during the university. Uh, I don't remember who with, but I remember it came up. Uh, it's actually kind of fun to do. I think it would be a neat project. Definitely not something to start right now, but just to kind of sow the seeds for a future uh, project for any anybody who's ambitious enough to take it up would be going through like a group of people in autonomy, deciding to read the underground history of American education and just making our own bibliography of it, going through everything pulling up the actual quotes, taking screenshots of the books, the PDFs, and uh, creating a sort of package around it. Uh, that would be really interesting. Uh, and the one last thing I'd like to add on the subject of Gatto uh, has to do with David Rodriguez. Uh, unfortunately, I missed the presentation that he gave, but just from that short clip that you played, um, what stood out to me was how he just did it. He just reached out to Gatto because that's what he wanted to do. And it wound up working for him. And um, this that harkens back to the top 10 problems that new students face. The one of those that really jumped out to me was waiting for permission. Uh, because that's, that's basically a nice way of saying you're waiting for you'll I'll blaze the trail, but somebody has to mow it first. You know, <laughs> Somebody's going to do half the work for you to get you where you're going. 
Uh, so when we're talking about reaching out to somebody like Gatto or, you know, Richard Grove or Brett Vinod, anyone who has a, a sort of presence that maybe we don't have, if you want to talk to that person, well, they don't know who you are. So it's not like, it's not like John Taylor Gatto is going to randomly send you an email one day. Hey, son, how you doing? Let's talk. Like you have to be the one to do it. And it's scary at first. And you know, you're, you, we make these excuses like, oh, well, you know, I'm not ready yet. Uh, maybe I don't have the right thing to say. If you just reach out, it'll probably work out. And then your fear will be alleviated and you can develop a solid relationship, which is what, what David was talking about. So I really appreciated that. Cool. I think that uh, you both hit on what I was trying to ask uh, very well, uh, specifically the fact that John had these experiences. Um, the historical research, I do think, comes second because he he showed through his own lifetime uh, an alternative to schooling that was you could see the results of it um, were a, more beneficial <laughs> than going through the school system. So yeah, his experiences speak for themselves. Uh, but your bib bibliography project would be cool. Um, and uh, I think uh, useful for the more academic types that are gonna, that are gonna explore this material because that has been um, uh, something I've heard said about his book is that it's uh, hyperbolic. I know that he had, uh, he didn't like scholarship, um, but he, I do think he put in a lot of uh, research into his book, so, uh, while he may phrase it certain ways that aren't uh, academic, I think he, <laughs> I think he has the experience necessary to back up what he's trying to assert. Um, yeah, so do we want to place another clip, Joshua? Sure. Let's do one more. The last part I want to share is um, about apprenticeships. So apprenticeships are more for the, the teenage um, age range, and it doesn't have to be. It can be, you know, as young as 10 or 11, 12 up there. But an apprenticeship is where you get connected with an expert or a master in the field. And I do believe that apprenticeships uh, going forward um, are going to be one of the key models for learning just because knowledge is doubling. I think they say every 13 or 14 months now, knowledge is doubling on earth. So think about that, how fast and how much information is happening right now. Nobody can predict what's going to happen tomorrow. Right? Otherwise, they would make all this money in investments. So for sure, we don't know what's going to happen in five years or 10 years. We can have a kind of a trajectory. But uh, the apprenticeship model is based on the win-win. Okay, So your child can now um, find a, a subject matter or an interest, an industry that they want to participate in. And then if they can identify an expert in that field, whether locally or online, they can reach out to them. And that's something that you can broker depending on your child's age. Um, but the idea is that they go volunteer for them with a sincere and, and clear commitment to help them out, to serve them in exchange for learning a little bit about that field. So one example, um, one of my friends, uh, he has a, uh, at the time his son was 15 years old. And I have a, another friend who was a DJ, professional DJ. So I said, hey, my friend has a 15 year old, he's learning about DJing, he wants to kind of um, learn a little bit, can he come help you? Can he come carry your stuff around and, and hang out? And the guy said, okay, he's gonna you know, carry my equipment, yeah. So what happens? The 15 year old goes and hangs out with the professional DJ for the day, carries his stuff, looks to see how the setup is, you gotta then uh, spin the music, and then you gotta pack up all that stuff, and you know, that's the end of the, end of the, the day, maybe five or six hours of work. So what was his conclusion, the 15 year old? He was like, man, like I like music, but I don't like being a DJ. <laughs> that was hard work. I really like that section. Uh, Cause it, um, Absolutely. not, not only because uh, his story example was a DJ and the, the apprentice <laughs> actually loading and unloading and realizing all the work behind uh, everything it takes in order to, to have that position. But uh, it reminded me of uh, when I was 14, 
I, I, I got offered to work with my uncle who was working at a storage, he was a storage unit manager downtown Seattle. And uh, he, I got to hop on a bus. Uh, I lived about 30 miles away. Hop on a bus when I was 14, go downtown all by myself, uh, go get to this building right next to the stadium. And then uh, I worked for him cleaning out storage units. Really odd, fascinating job because you're going through people's stuff uh, when they couldn't pay their bills. But that taught me so much more than uh, what I got out of school. Self-responsibility, uh, uh, situational spatial awareness of walking downtown through the kind of uh, not so pleasant areas by myself and uh, just giving me confidence on, 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 uh, on how to be responsible and uh, some worth at work ethic that really gave me a uh, direction on uh, getting into my first, first jobs. So I really like that apprenticeship model and uh, I hope to have it more concreted for my own kids uh, for them to be able to jump right into. Yeah, I think that's what this apprenticeship model is, is uh, you discerning what your interests are and then seeking out people uh, in the professional realm that are engaged in that topic. And then you can then you can get a real grasp of what your own model of reality is missing. <laughs> so you you can uh, you can use that feedback from reality to update your own model and determine, okay, is this something that I really want to do? Like in that DJ example, like the kid's like, I love music, but then and he so he has this idea of what DJing is like, but then he goes and into reality to experience that for himself. And then he can update his model of reality and be like, okay, that wasn't what I wanted. What's cool before I saw this presentation, I actually set up an interview with a, a lady's son who's interested in DJing. So I'm going to be talking to him next Wednesday, uh, just letting him kind of ask me whatever questions come to mind. But <clears throat> again, just to have these, uh, this, this idea that you can – you can investigate before you dedicate uh, into a career is, is, is huge because people are spending thousands of dollars and years in, in, uh, in university before they even check out what it is that they're committing to. You can test drive your future. You can test drive your future. <laughs> no, it's, isn't it crazy how, uh, Drop the affiliate link. Right. <laughs> there you go, Jim. Drop. <laughs> I want to be a doctor. I know that I want to be a doctor because doctors are good people. They help people. They're smart. Successful. They make a lot of money. So I'm going to go to medical school. I'm going to take out hundreds of thousands of dollars of loans. I'm going to spend 10, 12 years in school. I'm going to pass whatever their equivalent of the bar is. Get my uh, get my license to practice. I'm gonna find a spot, buy a spiffy white coat, get a shiny stethoscope, work a day on the job, and find out I hate it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like people. <laughs> yeah. Well, awesome. Hey, a of, that's a very uh, a, appropriate thing to say because a lot of people are going through that, um, and a lot of people have a lot of resentment for the education system because they go through that exact scenario you just laid out. Yep. Yep. And the doctor maybe is a bit of an extreme example, but I mean, well, maybe not. I mean, I don't really go to the doctor that often, but uh, when my mother used to drag me to the doctor, I don't know, I always seemed to notice that uh, a lot of them were kind of pissy, you know, <laughs> they're not particularly happy. I don't want to generalize, but there, it seemed like, a lot of the doctors that I did see didn't have that bedside manner that maybe you would want them to have. Like, they just kind of want to shuffle through the day. And I get it. Like, when I go to work, I want to go home. But if you're going to be a doctor, that might not be the attitude to have. Like, I want somebody who's just happier than hell to be there. You know, how are you doing? I want them to really 
really be uh, energetic and uh, passionate about their job. And unfortunately, the way things are now, it doesn't really seem to be the case all the time. And uh, not to mention the fact that you could to continue with the doctor example, you might think that a profession is one thing, like helping people. And then when you get there, it turns out that you're really just a, a pusher. You know, I think that's probably true for, for a lot of professions. Like with the DJ example, you think in your mind that, yeah, I'm just going to play music and have a lot of fun. Well, no, you, you, you also move things. Like there, there's more work. You're, you're, a, you're an electrician. <laughs> as Negotiations well. with clients, with mm -hmm. uh, reading the crowd, with uh, handling drunk ladies who's asking for Britney Spears. Yeah, there's a lot to it that you <laughs> Josh don't knows. see. <laughs> <laughs> right. you're, you're more things than you thought you would be. So, yeah, it, you got to test it out. You got to know because uh, a lot of people dig a really deep financial hole for themselves by committing to something that they like the idea of. So the, the, uh, the whole apprenticeship or being a journeyman kind of thing is something that maybe we'd be wise to, to pull out from the history books and reanimate. For sure. Yeah. I think another way to look at it is life is a, a giant experiment, you know? Um, get out there and, and, and be an adventurer. Uh, you know, take in information from everywhere. Because one of, one of John's uh, major uh, points was everyone is a, a potential teacher. So get out there, explore, try to learn from them, integrate it into your own understanding, and you'll have a, a more clear model of reality. And you'll be happier for it in the end. Well, David Rodriguez was uh, a great presentation, and uh, his full um, his full talk will be available here shortly, and we'll be able to share it with our friends uh, and being able to uh, really educate those around us. So next, I wanted to move on to uh, Amanda Price. She gave a, her second presentation on NVC and uh, empathic communication. I have a short little clip of a section that I just asked permission and got permission to, to share. Uh, and then we can just uh, discuss that. Earlier, I identified that feelings are to be distinguished from thoughts. In fact, they are a combination of bodily sensations and emotional states. So we commonly describe these sensations with phrases as you see in front of you. When we say we have a lump in our throats, we usually associate that with feelings of fear or anxiety. When we describe someone as hot-headed, we imagine their fear or their rage or their anger. And we all experience butterflies in our stomach, right? And that could be nervousness, excitement, maybe even new true love. Feelings arise from a combination of external and internal stimuli. The external being those inputs, that information that we're taking in through our senses, and then the thoughts that we have about that which we take in. A good example is the idea of a, that feeling of adrenaline when you see a child running after a ball into a busy street. When I observed the child run after the ball into the street and thought to myself, she's going to get hit, I felt terrified and wished for her safety. One purpose emotions serve is to alert us to what needs are most alive in us in the moment. For example, if you're feeling terrified, you're likely experiencing a need for safety and protection, just as the last example illustrated. Feeling excitement, you're likely experiencing a need or wanting a need for adventure, creativity, fun. And I, for one, have found that sharing my own emotions 
and seeking to understand others can really open the door to connection. A, to our own selves, when I know what's, what's going on in me and am able to self-connect, that brings a much richer self-awareness than, than when I don't do that. And it also connects us to our shared humanity with others. It can be really scary to be vulnerable in front of others. And yet, from my experience, and using judicious judgment in being vulnerable at times and sharing my vulnerability, I found that the connection that I can make with others can be more rewarding than any other interaction. Taking responsibility for our own feelings is not something that we're taught in school. So it may be surprising to explore the idea that we are not responsible for others' feelings. Think back to our childhoods when we were very likely, when very likely adults would say to us, don't say that, you'll hurt their feelings. In fact, we have been acculturated to think that we cause others' feelings and others cause ours. Others' words, actions, and behaviors indeed can and often do stimulate feelings in us. Yet nonviolent communication theorizes that the root cause of our feelings are the results of how we choose to think about what others say and do, as well as the needs and expectations that are up for us in that moment. There's so many truth bombs in, uh, in that short little clip. Uh, I was really raised with, uh, um, I was, my f feelings were allowed but typically uh, they came out in like anger and then I was like sent to my room and then going into my teenage years and just the environment of school and how it's just feelings are equated to weakness. And so, especially as a male that you just, you get, you, you tough it up, you, you man up and you don't share your feelings and and then for my own personal experience, getting into kind of drugs and escapism, uh, I was really detached from any sort of inner compass when it came to my feelings. And uh, not by the communication, I've been practicing for three years now, and it really, A, gave me permission to have feelings, uh, and, and that really had a light bulb turn on for me to where I was then allowing these this information, this data that your body's presenting to your consciousness uh, based off of the situations that you're in, to be able to take that in and allow it. And then uh, uh, as she just described, those feelings are attached to universal needs that are either being met or not being met. And so I can understand more about my inner self and uh, also those around me as you saw the cues of like, I'm feeling really uh, anxious or uh, <clears throat> pe people in their communication give you glances of what they're feeling with the words that they choose. And from that, you can follow that to understanding what needs are being met or not being met. And so uh, once you understand that and you can reiterate that back to them, it really like opens up the door of trust and communication um, and, and builds relationships. And it, it really mirrored uh, sales once I started to learn about being a salesman with integrity and <clears throat> how you can deepen your conversation with just with anybody right out, of the, right out of the bats using these methods to understand more deeply what's going on. Uh, yeah, I'll just say that I am not an NVC practitioner. Um, I'm aware of it. It's been on my radar for many years, but I've never delved into the material. But I see a parallel between uh, this alert system of feelings and uh, what I've been practicing in my own life. Because uh, it, it happened many years ago, I was dealing with a lot of anger issues uh, in conversations with family uh, revolving around certain topics. And over time, I developed uh, a keen sense of what my own inner state was uh, during these conversations. Uh, and 
that allowed me to gain insight into their own mental state. And uh, it allows it allowed for me to better build a bridge to them because uh, I was able to use that feedback of my own emotions to gauge where we were at in terms of reciprocating information. And then to acknowledge that, like you were saying, acknowledge those feelings uh, externally, um, you know, communicate it to them, and then you can uh, start to rebuild that bridge to get more information across. So even though I don't, I haven't practiced this yet, I, I see that I already have the seeds of uh, what NVC is in my own communication methods. Yeah, I'm, I'm like you in that I'm aware of it. I've been aware of it, but I haven't really delved into it. Although now I think I'd like to. Uh, you, that short clip has really uh, struck a lot of points for me. Um, the ideas that stood out, though, it seems like this is... Uh, a method of, well, it, it's like thinking about your feelings and feeling about your thoughts. You know, you're paying attention to what's actually going on internally rather than just either stuffing it all down and pretending it's not there or the, the opposite being just letting whatever you feel immediately take over you and possess you. Uh, it, it's like curating your thoughts and feelings in a way that organizes them and then allows you to communicate with uh, more effective mouth noises uh, than we otherwise might. <laughs> Beating somebody over the head verbally, verbally uh, as satisfying as it might be for us in the moment, um, usually doesn't work uh, in the long run. So uh, I, I appreciate I appreciate the fact that this exists, honestly. I mean, how long have people just been saying horrible, horrible things to each other um, without any form, like just, that's just what communication is, right? You're shitty to me and I'm shitty to you and that's life. Um, so the idea that, it, it's kind of crazy that it took this long. Uh, what was the name of the guy who- Marshall Rosenberg. Marshall yeah. Rosenberg. That was yeah. in what, the seventies? Yeah, yeah. So like, we're talking thousands and thousands of years. I mean, of course, you know, I'm sure that some elements of this have existed all throughout history, and some people are definitely nicer than others. But the idea that, I mean, we've got methods of learning, we've got methods of education, we've got methodologies for every art you can possibly imagine. But like somehow just not being a dick uh, seemed to not <laughs> land on the radar until the 1970s. Yeah. 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 And the, what MVC has given me is that my feelings are valid. Uh, and uh, something I never came across in all my like uh, personal development studies is that it's okay to get mad and <clears throat> giving myself permission in those situations where just stress, all these things combine. Uh, I'm really upset, but, and I'm okay to get mad, but I'm responsible with what I do with it. <clears throat> so long as I don't direct it at anybody and, and, and point my finger, then with, uh, like with my partner, like we can, we can get upset. We can yell like practicing NBC doesn't mean you're, you're nice. It, it just means that you're responsible with how you're directing your energy and you can raise your voice and get get upset and but you're not discharging and like blaming those around you 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 just can say i'm really upset right now and your partner can be like okay like i i get it uh, they can offer you some empathy or some support or take a time out but you're not you're not discharging because I've seen the damage that, that that discharge does. And Daniel, you just pointed out of people just get beat up in relationships and then it just turns into, into attacking each other. Every little micro gesture, behavior, like it, everything cascades after once it reaches that point. I so, got a question, Joshua. Yeah. So, um, if you're if you're in a conversation with someone who doesn't practice NVC or understand these things, uh, is it really is it really going to be helpful to yell and be like I'm angry? 
because won't that you know stimulate uh, an emotional reaction with them within them that could you know be detrimental to uh, the conversation? Sure, sure, and I I would be more contained with people that are less familiar with NBC. <clears throat> but I've built up trust with my partner because she's she practices it too. So uh, those concentric rings of relationships in your life, those inner ones are the most difficult. Uh, your your inner family, your 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 <clears throat> and then it goes out and especially talking to friends and friends and associates, you know, you're pretty contained out, out on those levels. Your vulnerabilities are, are quite layered internally. And so those really stressful moments seem to happen with your close, close friends and, and family. And <clears throat> luckily, uh, my, my sister-in-law who lives on the property, she's taking an NBC uh, like seven week course right now. So the more people you have around you with these tools, the more that we can operate in a, in a responsible manner. Yeah, I was, I was lucky enough to talk to Amanda with an integration exercise over the week, which is another thing that we do here in autonomy, right? We do integration exercises or otherwise uh, interviews, practices with other people, um, role playing. And, you know, I think uh, she's practicing what she's preaching also because a form of what she's doing is nonviolent communication to come up and do a class that's not required or anything to the course. It's just kind of an extracurricular thing to the course um, and it's voluntary. So it falls in lines with those principles of, you know, you can come and attend and you can listen to Amanda. She's a very good presenter. The slides that she's going over are very powerful and the message that she has is, is really good stuff. And I, I did uh, challenge her a little bit on it. I think that, like you said, Joshua, it's a tool. And I, I consider that a tool. I don't consider every tool to be necessary in every situation either. So for nonviolent communication, I think that it's, you know, I'll kind of play the, the Debbie Downer of the, the round table if that's necessary, but I, I, always casting that doubt, right, that there's a, de a negative side to any tool as well and that people use things like the trivium, like nonviolent communication, like neuro-linguistic programming to manipulate and uh, deceive people and to uh, get things out of them that they would uh, otherwise not have done or not have thought of. And uh, so, you know, again, in every conversation, am I practicing nonviolent communication? Absolutely not. In some scenarios, it's, you know, especially if someone's aggressing against you, even sort of uh, putting you in a state of duress or trying to become your master, right? In these scenarios, a lot of people are in a master slave uh, dynamic in their psychology. So even your boss at work, or there's certain times when I'm not trying to meet my boss's needs, because, you know, he might have the needs that he needs to be met, I might be able to perceive those and uh, make sure that I'm including what he needs in my conversation that I'm having with him, and not ignoring what he needs. But and this is a bad example, but politicians would be a more extreme example, right? So they're trying to sell you something. They're very trained, like uh, someone like Obama, in uh, using words, using speech, using rhetoric to make people think that he's got what you need, right? So there was a lot of people that thought there was a lot of change that was going to occur, um, that he was going to um, get them things that they needed, right? Uh, there was the free phone situation, right? And that was... So their needs were being met, right? So he understood how to do that, and especially on stage. And so, again, there's a negative side to communication and the tools that we're practicing in a positive light that I think a lot of people in the freedom movement largely misrepresent nonviolent communication. And they, they hear the word nonviolent and they just mix it in with their voluntarism and their already um, kind of set of tools that, they've, that they're accumulating, which I'm not necessarily casting them out. I'm just saying that um, there can be a tendency to just throw it in and not full without fully understanding what we're dealing with, what we're talking about. And then because of the name of it, because how it's represented largely by people in, in these circles, it's just kind of, oh, yeah, 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 for sure. And absolutely. And I'm not, I don't hear a lot of people, you know, with a full understanding of what they're talking about. Um, passing along information to other people about what it is basically. And so 
I always like to put the brakes on a little bit, cast a little bit of doubt, give some people food for thought. And uh, it doesn't mean that I don't fully agree with the tool. I think I'm exploring it still myself, especially with the inner talk, especially with the inner um, communication and the monitoring of how I'm communicating with myself. And I think that's where it's most valuable. Um, but then, of course, once you're, you're having a solid inner com uh, self connection, your, your relationships outside will get better. So Definitely. that was long winded, but doesn't it come down to integrity then like nvc is a tool but um whether or not it's used for manipulation uh depends on your integrity so obama he said he was trying to meet people's needs by saying oh i'll give you a free phone but uh he could be out of integrity if you know he doesn't do that or if he's doing it for another reason so it comes down to um, what's your integrity? What are your goals? Um, are you, uh, are you upfront with people about uh, what you really want? So honesty is a big part of it too. So I think you're right. Like NVC is a communication tool that could be used to manipulate, or it could be used, uh, to make a real connection with someone. Yeah. And that honesty starts with yourself because it's a, it is, it's an inside job first and then you can apply it externally and we will go in more. And I'd like to have Amanda here for this discussion, but uh, if you're using the framework of NVC, uh, then you're not really using NVC. It's a, it's an interesting concept because our minds latch on to frameworks but then putting it in practice looks differently and feels differently. And when you use that framework on other people, that's when it turns into manipulation and you're not, your goal isn't to build connection. Your goal is to get them to do what you want to do. And so there's a big distinction there. Okay. Yep. Well, this is a uh, really filling up time nicely. Uh, still have some cool things that we want to cover. And we have uh, loads. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, coming up this week, uh, I'm sure we're going to have uh, some more guests and more, more discussions. It's, we're going to be doing Q&A on Sundays, um, and uh, this might hit the airwaves uh, either Sunday or Monday. But uh, <clears throat> I kind of want to talk about what's, what's new with, with autonomy. Um, I, we have a, a team that is helping market and promote autonomy out to the world. And uh, there's lots of cool things in the works. I'm working with Tony on revamping up the website. Uh, we have a fantastic landing page that took a lot of people and a lot of time to to get up there so that we had a way to be able to, to share and a grasp of what autonomy is accomplishing uh, and be able to direct people to that. And now we're creating a, a zone for the students to be able to share student accomplishments. This podcast will end up being um, highlighted on this new website uh, along with blogs. Tony, you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. There's there's going to be another section called member blogs. So this is going to be just a spot where students, if they have content that they've created, uh, they can share it. And um, this will help, of course, with uh, getting autonomy, uh, organic traffic. Uh, but the most important thing is that we are providing value to the people who come there. Uh, what autonomy is really all about. So um definitely you know have have a focus on what it means to do the inner work uh to become autonomous uh which is a very broad range of things that you could write about so uh i'm really excited to see what uh people start to create and share on there and um it's going to be open for anyone who goes through autonomy so yeah if you're interested just uh give a shout and we'll get you set up to uh, begin writing and getting your content out there 
if you have your own personal blog and you would like to get your content on to get autonomy, then uh, we could do a, a redirect scenario um, where you have your uh, content hosted here and it redirects to your page, drives traffic to your projects too. So uh, it's, it's a win-win situation for everyone involved. And I think that it's also a great exercise too in um, your own communication and clarifying your own values and why you're here. Uh, just going through that writing process uh, forces you to think about what you're doing. <laughs> So I, I highly recommend it, and um, I think it would actually be a good integration exercise in the future to get people to uh, to write some uh, stuff on their own, even if they're not posting it. Because it's a great place to sharpen your skills, put it out there. You get uh, you get uh, some some feedback from a community that uh, isn't going to just troll you and put you down to try and elevate themselves, but you get actual feedback uh, that can help you understand areas that need to be strengthened. Yeah, it all goes back to that feedback, right? This will help with getting that feedback so that you can make adjustments in your own process and uh, grow in, uh, into that light direction, as, as Rich would put it, uh, a little bit faster. So with the, uh, the blogs on the site, are you uh, looking for anything in particular as far as content goes? Like, I guess what I'm asking is... Yeah, uh, is so, yeah, go ahead. yeah so as I was saying, I, I, I would like it to be related to your journey towards becoming autonomous in your own life. Uh, so that is a very wide range. So what I'm doing now is I'm, I'm gathering a list of uh, main topics that uh, we can categorize uh, these blog posts into. And that will give people a very good uh, insight into like what directions they can head into. So like uh, health, productivity, um, communication, learning, uh, all of these things are uh, components of becoming autonomous. So um, you could write about any one of those. Excellent, excellent. I, I like the sound of that. And a great thing about what we're organizing is the ability to uh, use your affiliate link so that uh, when you share this, either on your social media networks or on your website, uh, you could get credit for the traffic that that brings back to autonomy. Just to let the public know once you become a graduate of autonomy, you get a 50% affiliate link. So uh, when any of your traffic or recommended um, friends and family sign up for autonomy, then uh, Rich has so graciously uh, extended out a 50% return on, uh, or a 50% split on the enrollment fee. So all of us are highly incentivized to create our own content and to just do what we naturally do and share what's awesome in our lives. And this blog is an excellent opportunity to be able to do that and, uh, and uh, become autonomous with uh, multiple streams of income. That, yeah, like leverage your learning, right? That's, that's exactly. what it is. And that's a good segue into uh, another new project that we've just announced. Uh, and that's Autonomy Platinum. Uh, this is a new course that we just released, How to Leverage Your Influence. This is uh, available to uh, graduates to be able to use their platforms that they're creating. We have Chris with the Truth Conduit podcast. He's now gaining an audience. And this course is designed to walk influencers through step-by-step step how they can um, share autonomy with their audiences and again reap the benefits of uh, a win-win-win situation where uh, your audience gets to gain autonomy, you gain autonomy with a new revenue stream and uh, and everybody everybody grows and strengths, strengthens and uh, a rising tide rises all boats is what it really accomplishes. So we're excited to start putting this into uh, into work. 
And basically, if you know any uh, podcasters that align with freedom and, uh, and the values of autonomy, then you could uh, recommend having them be interviewed as a guest lecturer uh, with Richard and they could share their expertise and wisdom with the, 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 the community. And from that, they would get their own guest lecture landing page like we've created for uh, uh, like G. Edward Griffin was a good example who we had on a couple of weeks ago where we had him in, had him on as a guest. And uh, from that, we post that video that he's then able to share with his audience and use his affiliate link. So his audience becomes aware of autonomy and uh, he can invite them to uh, figure out some solutions uh, for their lives on how to get out of the situation that they're in and live a more autonomous life. And so this uh, course is really exciting because uh, instead of trying to get people uh, up to speed just through emails, this is a really step-by-step -step course for you to be able to understand how to leverage your influence. Yeah, I think this is great because uh, universities, uh, you know, they have marketing <laughs> up the wazoo, you know, they, they are advertising on television, uh, pulling people in through the mainstream media. And I think that this is going to be an excellent way for this real education to uh, find a little more traction. Uh, in, in the wider populace. So I, I think this is a, an important step uh, and, and it lends a lot of, um, it'll lend a lot of credibility to the program. Awesome, yeah. I'm really excited. This is next level marketing, uh, even for my career uh, is, is influencer marketing and we're really trying to make it as easy as possible for those influencers out there that are working hard to uh, promote their own um, audience and to how they can quickly leverage uh, everything that they've built and shoot them off so that they don't have a million, half a million subscribers on YouTube and trying to pay rent. Uh, this can be a different sort of uh, asset and uh, br bring in some real uh, income into their projects to be able to achieve what they want to do. And to know that as an audience that by getting autonomous for yourself, you're actually helping your uh, favorite podcaster or uh, content creator uh, is a pretty great feeling too. Yeah, I was, that's what I was just thinking too. It's like uh, their audiences are gonna be revitalized essentially. And um, I think what's gonna happen is this uh, network uh, that's bu being built is going to only get stronger because uh, each each person within the network is going to get stronger. <laughs> it, it's gonna and it's gonna uh, be this like exponential effect where suddenly all of the people who were uh, sitting on the sidelines and just being a consumer, they're going to be uh, empowered and be able to create their own content and. What's going to happen, I think, is that these people who are influencers now, their audience is going to grow because they're going to see, people are going to see that their audience is suddenly becoming more productive. They're uh, finding their own way in life. They're happier. Uh, they have purpose and meaning. And I, I think, yeah, it was like you said, um, with the metaphor of the rising ships, like rising tide will raise all ships. And that's what this is. And uh, I think it's absolutely wonderful. A lot of my YouTube uh, channels that I subscribe to do an excellent job at pointing out the problems in, the, uh, in our society and the global structure. And uh, to be able to then interject a solution is, I think, uh, something that's really needed. And what is it, get. tensegrity or something? Is that what it is? The, where um, each uh, point is like the the um, integrity of your structure 
is dependent on the integrity of each point. Mm. And so we build up the integrity of each point in this network of people that we're building. Uh, we gain more leverage in the world, really. So, um, cause what we're trying to do, I think is create an alternative reality. Uh, we're, we're trying to, uh, change the processes by which our cultures run. <laughs> and so what, what this whole process, uh, we have to, this influencer thing, we're going to take in new nodes, new people and make them not make them. I don't want to say that cause that's not Invite the right them. word. We're Invite going them. to help them ignite within themselves their own potential. And in the end, they'll be stronger, uh, more independent, and we'll have this great community of independent thinkers, and that's going to attract a lot of outside attention. And with all that outside attention, we have a lot more uh, likelihood of shifting the culture's paradigm. So, yeah, uh, that's why I think that uh, this Autonomy Influencer course is incredibly important uh, in, in helping spread these ideas, uh, not of just Richard's ideas, because where did Richard's ideas originate from? And you can trace that back to, of course, John's work. Uh, so that's why I find this so incredibly important. So uh, <laughs> exciting. Yeah, it is okay. exciting. I, I like it because, uh, I mean, you know, I would like to start a podcast of my own soon, relatively soon. Uh, so it's good to know that this course will be out there. Um, and of course, you know, Rich is a great navigator um, and he's experienced within the realm of podcasting and uh, generally just um, fielding a large audience. So any advice that he would have is obviously welcome. Um, and it's, it's nice to see that even already in just the second season, the autonomy menu is already expanding to, to the point where there's already like a second course. So does this mean that uh, like there are gonna be, there's gonna be a whole separate set of lectures? Um, is what about like the Discord situation? Is there gonna be another server? Uh, are these details ironed out already? They're, they're in the works, but what's really great about this and uh, give you a little peek is that these influencers that are gonna be coming uh, into autonomy to leverage what they've built. Uh, typically, all of them need assistance. Uh, they need uh, marketing. They need uh, support so they can do what they're doing even better. And as the student body gains more proficiency, we'll be able to offer these skills along with uh, with with uh, giving them access to autonomy as well. So there's going to be a lot of opportunities for, uh, I'll dare say, apprenticeship uh, in the coming future uh, in order for us to get real world experience and uh, testimonials so that we can build credibility in order to uh, know our own self-worth and get paid for what we love to do. <laughs> That's awesome. Autonomy, creating jobs. <laughs> yeah, we don't need government. Right. <laughs> it's true. Well, uh, I think we've had a really rich um, episode for our first one, and I uh, just want to kind of uh, finish it off with a couple memes that I picked up from this last week. There was a meme storm last night, and uh, I, I was really <laughs> just – uh, highly entertained, but also just wanted to grab uh, a couple of highlights and uh, just to kind of close out the, the show with. Uh, what was funny is Rich let me out of uh, my duties last night early on question and answer time because of, uh, every, of people taking control of their own mics and uh, cameras themselves. And so I was excited to go to bed a little bit early because I knew how to get up early for today's um, podcast. And I went home. I walked walked across the driveway, opened up the door, and my cat ran out the door. 
he was like waiting for me. I don't know how he knew. He ran out the door. It was raining. And I spent the next half hour chasing after him with the flashlight. And uh, she, she finally ran up a, a tree and I was able to grab her before she got too high. Uh, so I still made it to bed. I, I think I was asleep by midnight. So uh, just had some good good memes to uh, to to highlight those with and after the memes, I think there should be one more segment that it's real quick. What? So and that that'll be we share our weekly recommendations. So <laughs> like uh, just like list one or a couple things of uh, things you recently discovered or enjoyed that you'd like to share with people. For Maybe sure. Why don't you start us off, Tony? Okay. Uh, well, on adversity. <laughs> I, I think, uh, I think that is the highlight of my week. Really. Uh, I think I encourage people, um, to definitely spend, spend that money, uh, support Brett and his ad- adventures and his, uh, yeah, uh, his, his ventures, I mean, so because it's very valuable, it's worth, uh, the $250 or whatever it is to get the full package. Um, it's not like it's it's like taking the best parts of his podcast series, condensing them, and giving it to you in this neat package that's very practical and will help you uh, overcome your information overload and move into uh, actually creating things. Yeah, and I that's think my he, suggestion. Anyone else, Scott? He'll be he'll be doing an encore. I heard uh, like I think right after New Year's, so keep an eye out for that. And it's definitely worth. Uh, worth watching. Yep. Daniel? Yeah. Uh, well, Tony already said the university, so I have to pick something different. Um, this week, I, I started reading the Iliad. Um, that's another thing that uh, seems to have cropped up in autonomy as a great books group. Uh, so, Can you describe that a little bit? Yeah, yeah. Um, there's the there's this set from the 50s called The Great Books of the Western World that was put out by Encyclopedia Britannica by uh, a bunch of dudes who thought that they had a, a handle on what made Western civilization. And so uh, in the first season, a group of people that involved Tony, uh, I was not involved in this, um, got together and decided they would read this set, uh, probably with some minor alterations. And uh, I didn't have the time in my schedule to commit at that point, but now for season two, I do. So we've got a whole new Discord server set up for anyone who's interested. And uh, I'm hoping to take the set that already exists that was laid out by these, you know, academic, uh, stuffy old men back in the day and expand it to include uh, differing points of view that aren't included in the set. Um, But still, a lot of the things that are in the set I would like to read personally. So the first book is the Iliad in the set, and uh, I started reading it. I'm maybe about a third through, and I'm really enjoying it. I So I would have to highlight that as a an important part of my week because, A, it's just nice to get started on this great books project. I've been wanting to do it for a long time. Um, but also, you know, uh, already I can see why the Iliad made it into that set. It is... Uh, really a a masterpiece so far. Uh, Homer is definitely my favorite ancient Greek poet. Um, (laughs) Definitely better than uh, Hesiod, however you pronounce his name. But uh, yeah, it's it's nice to see. My favorite thing about ancient literature is uh, noticing things that are are still common to us today, like their their senses of humor. Um, Alice says misogyny. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that, that's that's part of it. that is definitely in there. I mean, the oh, Iliad yeah. is uh, very, very rapey. Um, but you know, it's it's important to read these things because they are they are instrumental in the formation of our culture, and we need to understand that uh, you know there there are positive elements and there are very negative elements. So. Uh, the reading the Iliad is already giving me an appreciation for the dynamic nature of our culture. So, sorry, that's long-winded, but that's my my input for the week. <laughs> awesome, Tyler. Uh, yeah. So, 
a little bit of personal information for me this week is I uh, work in a corporation, uh, unfortunately, but fortunately, one of those things that, like I was saying earlier, everything's a process. Uh, fortunately, I'm able to work from home and I also do other things outside of just work uh, at this one job that I think help kind of build in some fault tolerance and redundancy. Um, I like to play things safe, sometimes maybe a little bit too safe. But anyway, long story short, that place that I work for was purchased by a larger place. And there was a lot of things in limbo. And it was at one point uh, definitely questionable if I was going to even continue on there. And just having autonomy and the autonomy community and then being able to, uh, you know, kind of provide my skill set to the community and then integrate uh, relationships uh, with people that can we can we can both share uh, and help each other if something like the worst that fortunately didn't happen for me did happen and it, it's definitely a good feeling to know that I can offer my skill set to, to the things that you guys were just talking about um, with the with this affiliate and the influencer programs and people that will be actually looking for uh, autonomizers to come in and actually maybe fulfill tasks for them. Um, that's just really good to know that that's there. And then, um, you know, for me personally, I, as you can see, <laughs> I have uh, other people that depend on me and that's something that I have to keep in mind all the time when I make my decisions and keeping in mind all the information that I'm aware of about how things are actually working. And uh, as angry as I am, just like just like several people have expressed and like David and Joshua were expressing about certain things, you know, we do the best we can do. We homeschool our children. Uh, we, we try to um, live the best way we can, you know, without making things worse for ourselves or anyone else. Um, but I think this podcast is, is to, to capitalize on, on what I'm saying here is, is another really exciting thing that comes out of this is, is something that I've always wanted to do is participate. So where I can and when I can, I want to help participate in this uh, weekly thing. And Joshua, I know this is something you have wanted to host and it might not be, you know, exactly what you were envisioning at one point and maybe you'll have other things that come out of it, but Hey, here you are doing what you expressed to me a couple of weeks ago that you eventually wanted to have set up is an open conversation of people coming in, being able to express their, their thoughts about something kind of have it rotate with guests and other people. So, you know, I want to congratulate you and I think you did a really good job tonight and here you are doing what you said a couple of weeks ago to me was one of your goals. So that's autonomy, man. I mean, because uh, here it's like a test bed and a, a Petri dish for growth uh, is what I'm witnessing um, for those that are ready to kind of get in stride with what's happening here. Uh, it's a beautiful thing and I'm happy about all those things this week. So... With that, I'll pass it on to Tony. That was wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. But uh, actually, Joshua, you have yet to share. Yeah, thanks for those kind words, Tyler. Uh, it's been a pleasure to, to have others to make projects happen with, uh, going from ideas to, like, none of us had to be told what to do in order for this to happen today. We just put it out there. Those that were interested jumped on it, naturally supported and, and con contributed. And uh, I'm pretty impressed with, uh, we've filled up nearly two hours today uh, in a really natural and uh, rich uh, conversation. So I'm excited for uh, these future uh, weekly highlights. We might have to do a highlight of the highlight uh, <laughs> podcast, uh, but yeah, I'm, I hope to be uh a part of these from uh, now moving forward. And uh, it's just great to know that we're all going to be able to uh, support this moving forward. Uh, one little tech tidbit that I'll share that I was excited about this week, learned about, uh, and we turned on breakout rooms for Zoom. And uh, what that means is if we do practice sessions, so uh, I, I originally thought of this for Amanda and NBC, uh, we could do real world practice sessions of uh, using these tools and rule and role plays. But if we have uh, 20, 30 people in attendance, we could hit breakout rooms and it automatically splits everybody into their own like five, six person rooms 
where they can then have a smaller group to be able to uh, more intimately practice uh, what the presenter is talking about and then bring them all back into uh, like the webinar feature. So that's pretty awesome. I'm really excited to uh, test that out. And I think it'll add even more uh, depth and dynamic uh, to uh, the presentations as they go move forward. And i um, uh, really excited to, uh, yeah, see how that works. <laughs> Do it live. Yeah, it's like an online workshop. So that's cool. Yeah. Well, that's it for this week's episode of Do It Live Autonomy Podcast. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for Tony, Daniel, Tyler for joining me today. Uh, and thanks to all our guest speakers for sharing their tips uh, and uh, helping out uh, everybody with uh, emboldening themselves and becoming more autonomous. Join us again next week. But first, make sure you subscribe to the podcast on YouTube so you never miss one of these episodes. And if you want to know more how you can get autonomy, go to getautonomy.info and tell them any one of us sent you. Peace. Thank you.